So good morning to you all. Welcome to the fourth uh, Marxist Feminist Conference. It is organized by Transform Europe, uh, the University of Basque Country, along with Irazar Foundation from the Basque Country, the Bilbo Barcelona Critical Theory Group, the Berliner Institute for Critical uh, Theory, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, and the Parte Hartuz Research Group. Um, this is the first uh, session for today. It takes place alongside with two other panels. It is about production and uh, reproduction in the public and private sphere. It will last two hours. My name is Angelina Yanopoulou. I am a political scientist and the facilitator of Transform Europe which is a European left-wing think tank. And as I told you, one of the organizers of this conference since the very beginning. Um, we have four speakers for today, four excellent uh, speakers relate working uh, with questions of uh, reproduction, uh, a topic that is uh, quite relevant in the contemporary feminist theory and the topic that actually is the meeting point of feminism and Marxism. Um, the first speaker would be Ankitze Tsakerditz. She's an associate professor and the chair of social uh, philosophy and the philosophy of gender at the Faculty for Humanities and Social Sciences, Sciences in uh, the University of Zagreb. Her research interests include uh, social philosophy, Marxism, contemporary philosophy, intellectual history, Luxembourgian and Marxist feminist critique of political economy and the history of women's struggles in Yugoslavia. She's also a member of the complete works of Rosa Luxemburg editorial board and her presentation for today is titled Class History of Gender, Political Marxism Meets Social Reproduction Theory. Uh, the second speaker for today is Montserrat Galceran. She comes from Spain. She's an emeritus professor of philosophy at the Complutense University of Madrid. Uh, her political activism has led her also to participate in various international academic, but also non-academic networks uh, for knowledge of the current political context. She was a member of uh, Ganemos Madrid, Let's win. Uh, she was elected councillor for the Aora Madrid in May 2015 elections, and she was appointed also councillor president of the districts of Moncloa, Aravaca, and Tetuan. Her presentation for today is titled Reading Marx with a Feminist Gaze. The third speaker for today comes also from Spain is Cristina Catarina Gallego, and she's a lecturer at the Department of Philosophy and Society, again in the Complutense University of Madrid. Her research activity uh, is focused on the conceptualization of different genealogical moments of the present from the dialogue between philosophy, history, and social sciences. And her contribution for today is titled Gender, Family, and Work towards a genealogy of patriarchy in neoliberal capitalism. Our last speaker comes from Austria, Vienna, is Maria Zagmeister, and she's a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Legal uh, Philosophy in the University of Vienna, and also a postdoctoral fellow of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. She deals with the question of law, and how can contribute to a more equal distribution of unpaid care work between men and women. And currently she's researching the commodification of the work and the invisibility of labor in this field, which is often done in private households and under precarious legal conditions. Her presentation for today is called Recentering Class in Intersectional Legal Gender Studies. M making working mothers the benchmark in labor law protection. So each speaker has 15 to 20 minutes uh, for her contribution. And then we will take questions from the audience that would be only uh, in written form using the chat box um, that you have here. Uh, we have to be very strict on time. 
Uh, it lasts two hours and um, thank you all for being here. I am now giving the floor to our first speaker, Ankita, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Um, this is actually my fourth Marxist Feminist Congress and um, I'm happy to take um, again part in it after Berlin, Vienna and Lund. Uh, thank you for having me here today and uh, thank you Angelina for moderating uh, and, and setting this panel up. Um, so you heard the title of my presentation, the class history of gender, political Marxism, its social reproduction theory. Um, so the pandemic and its cascade of economic, social and political breakdowns had led to a profusion of thinking in terms of social reproduction. Suddenly notions and phrases relating to social reproduction are all over social media feeds as people confronted with what kinds of labor are considered essential and why. But simultaneously, the attacks on so-called gender ideology have grown in recent years throughout the world, dominating public debate stoked by electronic networks and backed by extensive right-wing Catholic and evangelical organization. That is why it makes no sense for gender critical feminists to ally with reactionary powers in targeting both the very notion of gender, but also trans, non-binary and gender queer people. So these are the two main reasons, or better say motives, um, the pandemic and the attacks on so-called gender ideology, why I have decided to make today at Fourth Marxist Feminist Congress a contribution to a discussion on gender through the lenses of social reproduction theory and political Marxism. The main goal of my presentation is to try to locate times that a process of feminization of reproductive labor may be traced. Shortly, I argue that the abolition of direct social relations and the beginnings of forming the everyday life according to market dynamics reshaped gender relations already under early agrarian capitalism. Households were progressively losing their ability to cope with capitalist dynamics and imperatives. And in a times when household labor was being devalued and separated from the sphere of production, the lives of women were gradually becoming confined to the reproductive sphere. It is from these times that the process of feminization of reproductive labor may be traced. In order to demonstrate these claims in a clearer manner, I will combine social reproduction theory and political Marxism, since it seems to me that both of these traditions offer the most valid explanations for the reasons behind the gender oppression and its reproduction in capitalism, and remind us that feminist struggle cannot fulfill its goals unless it tackles capitalist mode of production in its totality. In order to make a serious feminist emancipatory change in terms of political economy, we have to understand what capitalism is and what are the origins of class and gender submission. I believe that both social reproduction theory and political Marxism will help us in that task. On the one hand, social reproduction theory provides an entry into the tacit issue on the link between the market and the reproductive labor. Let us remind the goal of social reproduction theory is to grasp what is not visible in the process of production. It asks what kind of processes enable a worker to show up at her workplace and examines the conditions of her existence and social processes related to those conditions. On the other hand, political Marxism developed as a reaction against a historical models of Marxist analysis in the debate on the transition from feudalism to capitalism. It provoked a turn away from structuralism and teleology towards historical specificity as contested process and lived praxis. 
When Marxist feminists discussed the potentials and pitfalls of Marxism in the domestic labor debate during 70s and 80s, the specific relationship between class and gender, and even more between patriarchy and capitalism emerged as a defining concern. While focusing on the critique of Marxism, feminists somehow avoided the question of capitalism's origins. On the other hand, political Marxists, such as Ellen Mason Wood or Robert Brenner, had devoted large attention to this question in their own attempt to renew historical materialism. Still, political Marxism dialogue has dedicated little attention to questions of gender, families, and social reproduction in the feminist sense. My task, my modest task, is to undertake an intervention in closing the analytical gap between these two historical materialist traditions and to emphasize that gender and sexuality under capitalism are conditioned and shaped by specific rules of social reproduction. If capitalist mode of production is to be interpreted from the perspective of gender, it is necessary to take into account how gender is capitalistically organized and subject to the law of value, specialization, technical innovation, and accumulation. Among the pioneers of dissecting these issues, especially in terms of dual system tradition, are Maria Mies, Wallace Ocom, Patty Quick, and Silvia Federici, without which my topic today would simply not be possible. In her book, Caliban and the Witch, Women, the Body and Primitive Accumulation, Federici attempted to investigate the Marxist issue on capitalist primitive accumulation from the feminist perspective, or in her own words, the goal was to pave the way for reinterpretation of history of capitalism and class struggle from a feminist point of view. So what is capitalism? If we describe capitalism, as the economic system that produces commodities with the purpose of exchanging them on the market, then we can claim with some certainty that it existed since the time immemorial in some shape and to some degree. If we continue along these transhistorical lines, then the history of capitalism becomes a review of the development of exchange, trade and commercialization in given national or global context that in various ways condition and expansion and the organization of a market. In this case, the description would assume the form of explanation and the questions such as what are the origins of capitalism would in fact cease to make sense. From the historical materialist standpoint, capitalism is understood as a very complex historical system of social property relations, which due to the specifics of its productive and reproductive processes, substantially differs from feudal and slaveholding systems. It is a system in which absolutely all economic participants, be the producers, reproducers, or the appropriators, are to a certain extent dependent on the market for fulfilling the basic needs. Accordingly, nobody enters the socio-political arena directly, but rather indirectly through the mediation of the market. Unlike capitalism, in feudalism, for instance, peasants adopted the rule of self-governing, as Brenner would put it, in order to ensure direct and generational safety, they reduced the specialization of labor to its minimum, usually maintained large families, polarized the landed property and encouraged marriages at an early age. With the separation of the political and economic under capitalism, the basis of women's oppression in politically mediated exploitative relation was dramatically altered. In pre-capitalist societies, the generational reproduction of the labor force was directly connected to exploitation and accumulation through extensive political mechanism. Under capitalism, exploitation and accumulation is mediated by the market. When it comes to gender occupational specialization in terms of social reproduction, different research records demonstrate how women engage in household activities like cooking, washing, knitting, rearing children and caring for sick and elderly. However, it bears mentioning 
that there is no definitive proof for these activities were all that working lives of women compromised. Historian Chris Middleton stresses, quote, but at all events, the full housewife is not the typical female figure, unquote. Besides, the intensity of a woman's household labor depended significantly on the size of the estate on which her family lived and worked, the type of feudal rent they paid, and her marital status. Since feudal system was overwhelmingly focused on producing use value, in such a context, differences between household and public work, that is between the productive and reproductive sphere, were nearly completely undistinguishable. The abolition of direct social relations and the beginnings of forming the everyday life according to market dynamics reshaped gender relations already under early agrarian capitalism, that is much before the industrialization of society in such early capitalist, capitalist relations of productions, which were still taking place on the level of household craft manufacturing rather than huge industrial facilities, households were progressively losing their ability to cope with capitalist dynamics and imperatives. In her study, Enclosures, Common Rights and Women, economic historian Jane Humphreys uses a whole series of examples to demonstrate how the remnants of common rights in England played a key role in ensuring a certain degree of women's emancipation from male, male wage workers and how consequential they were for the material reproduction of the family as a whole. As the agrarian capitalists and parliamentaries began to increasingly throttle common rights, indirectly producing the most disastrous consequences for the material status of women, the latter turned into a forefront force in defending common rights. Federici, in her already mentioned work, cites a plethora of examples to demonstrate that feudal society was in fact not a static world, but that peasantry nearly daily engaged in manifold class struggles. Following the so-called transitional changes from feudalism to capitalism, the abolition of common rights and increasing commodification of human lives, women of all classes had it all more difficult to pass onto the change in social relations in particular when it came to limiting their access to property and income. Federici notes, quote, in the Italian commercial towns, women lost their right to inherit a third of their husband's property, so-called tertia. In the rural areas, they were further excluded from land possession, especially when singled or widowed. As a result, by the 13th century, they were leading the movement away from the country, beginning the most numerous among the rural immigrants to the towns. And by, by the 15th century, women formed a large percentage of the population of the cities. Here, most of them lived in a poor conditions, holding low paid jobs as maids, hucksters, retail traders, spinisters, members of the lower guilds, and prostitutes, end of quote. As was the case with the commutation, women were quite heavily struck by the dissolution of rural communities. One of the factors that contribute to that were, as Federici argues, the hardship women experienced when they attempted to follow in the footsteps of male wanderers and migrant workers as nomadic way of life, life exposed them to various sorts of male, female, uh, of male violence. In the times when household labor was being devalued and separated from the sphere of production, the lives of women were gradually becoming confined to the reproductive sphere. It is from these times that the process of feminization of reproductive labor may be traced. At the same time that the reproductive labor was being feminized, a specific population ideology was in formation, aiming at stressing the importance of family and directing its main focus towards the reproduction of workforce. 
laws were passed that introduced revolts for marriages and sanctions for celibacy. And in the 16th and 17th century England and France, pronatalist measures were legally enforced, fueling the existing capitalist policies on reproduction. Even economic historian Eli Heckscher describes the trend with these words, an almost fanatical desire to increase population prevailed in all countries during the period where mercantilism was at its height in the latter part of the seven, in the later part of the 17th century. This brief sketch of gender history under early capitalism did not do justice to the extremely complex topic ahead and such a project is beyond the scope of this paper. My goal was set at a far more moderate level and consisted of undertaking an intervention into the context of Marxist feminist debates on the so-called transition from feudalism to capitalism and emphasizing that gender is historically conditioned. In other words, gender has its history, a class history, and is under no circumstances a mere derivation of the physical sex. The body is biologically reproduced, not capitalistically. However, the organization of this biologic activity is also historically and socially conditioned. Once, our Marxist feminist analysis is set to explain the specific rules of reproduction that instantiated feudal social property relations, we arrive at a more useful and open historical material concepts, ones that enable us an integration of gender into a materialist analysis that explains the casual significance in social change. Pre-capitalist relations of exploitation, given their politically mediated character, carried direct implications for gender relation. In fact, if rules of reproduction are to be sufficiently comprehensive, they must recognize the unitary nature of relation of exploitation on the one hand and gender relations on the other. Gendered occupational specialization and discrimination clearly preceded capitalism. However, this fact should not be taken as evidence of an autonomous patriarchal structure or the functional necessity of a sexual division of labor, nor just a simple or self-understanding extension of pre-capitalist forms of patriarchy. Our Marxist feminist task is to locate the origins of gender oppression in the processes of so-called transition and to warn of the specificity of capitalism in order to demonstrate how gendered pre-capitalist rules of reproduction were reshamed, reshaped and transformed by the social relations of market dependence. Gender discrimination is part of the internal working of capitalist social property relations. If we want to make a serious anti-capitalist change in terms of gender emancipation, we need to understand the reasons and origins of gender oppression and its history. I believe this is exactly the point where political Marxism and social reproduction theory enter and give us the tools for explaining and understanding gender oppression in capitalism today. Thank you for, the, for your attention. Thank you so much, Santikita. Thank you so much. I am giving the floor now to Montserrat. Thank you. Uh, uh, good morning, thank you for your invitation. And I have a presentation. Maybe you have, yes? Okay, uh, the title of my presentation is Reading Marx with a Feminist Gauge. Uh, the gauge of a Marxist feminism has been always problematic since neither Marx or classical Marxism gives a preeminent place to women or to feminine or feminist labor. Uh, the gender reading is absent in the pages of Marx and in most of the Marxists, except Clara Zetkin and Rosa Luxemburg, and of course, Alexandra Kolontai. 
Nonetheless, Marx's analysis has been important for some feminist development. So for, for example, for Silvia Severici and for the entire group of the Ways for Domestic Work with Maria Rosa de la Costa and Selma James, but also for the group of Frida Hauk and the Journal das Argument or even the analysis of Maria Mies. Uh, then uh, I, uh, I say the funny thing is that Marx devoted so little attention to reproductive labor, contrary to the development devoted to other questions, such as the distribution of the profit rate, etc. Uh, then in that follows, I will try to provide some elements to explain this strangeness, not without setting uh, some coordinates. Then first, I will begin with the presentation of the theory of value. Uh, the concept of value as time of social labor materialized in the commodities that Marx develops in the first phase of volume one of capital is basic for the formulation of the law of value, which makes it possible to explain the change of commodities according to an immanent dynamic, namely the labor pain or value spent on the average social production of each of them. The dynamics of value and that of the regulation of working time, which includes the technical dimension associated with productivity, underlies the price system and is more or less imperfectly translated into it. But there is no reversibility between the two. So that although, according to Marx, value must be presupposed in order to understand the dynamics of price, Price do not translate value into the market realm. Rather, all of Marx's efforts are devoted to inserting the capitalist market into the dynamics of social work. Now, Marx insists that labor creates value and constitutes the substance of value, but in itself, labor does not have any. And it does not have it because it is an activity, to be precise, an activity oriented to a useful purpose. This is to say, value is the materialization and objectivization of work, measured in time, but at the same time, it cannot have value itself, since it is not the materialization of any labor. It is, as we have said, an activity in progress. A problem arises here that constitutes one of the first problematic knocks of capital. If labor has no value, how can it be treated at exchange as a commodity in the labor market? Does labor challenge the law of commodity exchange? Is it a special case so that the exchange is purely arbitrary and therefore pure exploitation? Or the other way around is the case that there is no exploitation and there is a fair remuneration as liberals advocate. Uh, next, please. Marx proposed a solution to this dilemma with the concept of labor power. Labor has no value, but labor power namely the work capacity of workers present in their physical embodiment does. And as with any other commodity, it consists of the labor time necessary to produce the inputs that keep it alive and allow its reproduction. That is the cost of the goods and resources necessary to live and whose value amounts to the worker's wage. But funnily enough, there is a complete lack a refer of reference to gender in the development of this topic. When establishing this value of labor power, Marx is restrictive. Um, citation by labor power or capacity for labor is to be understood the aggregate of those mental and physical capabilities 
existed in a human being, which he exercised whenever he produced a use value of any description. The value of labor power is determined as in the case of every other commodity by the labor time, time necessary for the production and consequently also the reproduction of this special article. So far as it has value, it represents no more than a definite quantity of the average labor of society incorporated in, a, in it. Labor power exists only as a capacity or power of the living individual. Its production consequently presupposes existence. Given the individual, the production of labor power consists in his reproduction of himself or his maintenance. For his maintenance, he requires a given quantity of the means of subsistence. Therefore, the labor time requisite for the production of labor power reduces itself to that necessary for the production of those means of subsistence. In other words, the value of labor power is the value of the means of subsistence necessary for the maintenance of the laborer. His means of subsistence must therefore be sufficient to maintain him in his normal state as a laboring individual. The value of labor power resolves itself into the value of a definite quantity of the means of subsistence. It therefore varies with the value of the means or with the quantity of labor requisite for the production. Uh, end of citation. So far, the statement is very categorical. And yet, the paragraph is introduced below that somewhat relativizes it. His natural wants, such as food, clothing, fuel, and housing, vary according to the climatic and other physical conditions of his country. Nevertheless, in a given country, at a given period, the average quantity of the means of subsistence necessary for the laborer is practically of no. But what about women and their reproductive labor? For Marx, the value of labor power includes the cost of reproduction. A citation, the owner of labor power, it is the worker, is mortal. If then his appearance in the market is to be continuous and the continuous conversion of money into capital assumes this, the seller of labor power must perpetuate himself in the way that every living individual perpetuates himself by procreation. The labor power withdrawn from the market by wear and tear and debt must be continually replaced by at very least an equal amount of fresh labor power. Hence, the sum of the means of subsistence necessary for the production of labor power must include the means necessary for the laborer's substitutes, it is his children, in order that this race of peculiar commodity of nuts may perpetuate its appearance in the market. Uh, end of citation. The length of the citations allow us to verify that Marx does not introduce her the labor of maintaining life, nor that of reproduction, and only takes into account the value of resources. He goes blind when it comes to this point. We could say in his favor that in his time, his labor existed in a little differentiated way. Among the wealthy classes, it was service labor that Marx correctly identified as a host of rent. This were the workers he describes as unproductive, such as servants, lackeys, catchmen, and so on. In the case of workers, this lay specifically with female workers who did so in terrible precarious conditions. Thus, there was not captured by capital of the space of social reproduction in a capitalist way, as it exists today, nor had the figure of the housewife spread so much as a specific form of reproduction of the waste labor force, which added to a certain patriarchal bias, 
may explain an absence that today abides unjustified. We can say that Max, uh, next, please. Not uh, yes. Uh, we can say that Marx speaks about the exploitation of women as workers and the exploitation of the worker family, not about the exploitation of the women self. However, given that the labor force commodity ultimately human beings, uh, the, the former, please. But yes. No? No, no. I guess. Yes, yes. Yeah. The, the formal means are not produced in a commodified chain. Its conversion and treatment as a commodity generates an in, enormous amount of violence, as Polanyi highlights when classifying it as a fictitious commodity together with land and money. Marx generally speaks of this violence in its relationships with the separation between the land of the means of production and the workers, which he treats as a historical event that sets the beginning of capitalism. And at the same time, he pays attention to the violence at work in the struggle to extend the working day. In fact, it is the first mention ever of class struggle in capital's text. While strong denouncing the brutality of the system that threatens the health and continuity of the workers' lives by subjecting them to very hard living conditions since childhood. In the case of women, he mentioned some cases related to the specific exploitation of female workers. His conclusion, his conclusion is that in this way, the global exploitation of the working class family and of women with their own framework is expanded. Capital captures the labor of reproduction insofar as it incorporates into its dynamics all members of the family, women and children included, and includes in itself valorization, the commodified labor necessary for consumption, that is the labor we call reproduction and care work. Now, we can say that Marx does not make visible the processes of reproduction of the material preconditions of society itself, nature, the labor force itself, as well as social preconditions, the social relations of production themselves, as antagonistic dynamics or as entities with their own dimensions. He does not make visible non-commodified or non-waste reproduction processes in capitalist society itself, except when they appear as remnants of a past on the way to extinction or that take place in very precarious conditions. What Marx does not see is that precisely this commodity called labor power is reproduced in the house through the labor of women. Now, a new problem appears. If if the labor power as a commodity is produced in the domestic framework, it cannot be external to the system, but internal to it, although it is not regulated by the, by the same logic. As it is said in the famous book by Maria Rosa de la Costa and Selma James, the rule of capital through the ways compels every able-bodied person to function under the law of division of labor and to function in ways that are, if not immediately, then ultimately profitable to the expansion and extension of the rule of capital. As a result, it must be said that the Marxist categories that allow us to understand capitalist society stripped of their restrictive connotations, extend far beyond the borders of the factory and allow us to understand the social whole, its face and its underside, the world of labor and the one that, unlike the farmer, 
And the, the this label that is defined as non-waste and non-labor, but not for, for that reason is non, as non-capitalist. The next, please. Then in a society- Montserrat, you have five minutes. Uh, yes. Yes. Thank you. Then in a society in which the capitalist system is hegemonic, we find ourselves in a situation of real subsumption in which the capitalist uh, logic extends to all areas of labor. But since, like we said before, human beings escape this reduction and not all the links of the upbringing processes are fortunately subjected to it, then the tension between capitalist production and the maintenance of human reproduction becomes a very strange space. Real substantion can never fully capture the whole process. It's for, it's for this reason that I think the feminist movement had a very important anti-capitalist balance. We are faced with an ambivalence. The capitalist system is considered as if were a totality that encompasses the reproduction of the whole, but by totalizing the domination of capital and treating the subsystem of reproduction of human life just as reproduction of capital, we lost sight of its own configuration, which is largely not expressed as capital and does not follow his logic. Uh, accordingly, next please. Yes, feminist economics sets out from the assumption that there are two subsystems in capitalist social production. The formal subsystem made up of production for the market through wage labor, and the informal system that integrates domestic work together with other, other non waste regulated forms of production and distribution. And this uh, informal a subsystem, according to feminist economists such as Christina Carrasco and others, uh, may amount to a 50% of family income. For others, uh, like Lourdes de Media, unpaid work, work which includes not only so called domestic work, constitutes approximately between a quarter and a half of the economic activity which, however, is not indexed in GDP figures. Uh, next. Then, accordingly, the feminist economics has a strong anti-capitalist balance, but not only because it shows how domestic labor contributes to the formation of surplus value, but rather because it highlights the reductive character of an analysis focused only on its production. Therefore, it unveils the violence implicit in an economic system whose goal is the extraction of surplus value and the issuing of accumulation to which it opposes a form of wealth or of wealth production that is subordinated to the satisfaction of needs and the maintenance of life. This may lead us as far as to claim that the hegemony of the capitalist commodity logic constitutes the main obstacle against the provision and procurement of the daily well-being of the population. Next, please. Next. Then we can say Maybe from a feminist and Marxist perspective, one would say, finally, unfortunately, the time of capital is over. Thank you. Thank you, Monserrat. Thank you so much. I am now giving the floor to Cristina Catalina Gallego. Hello, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you uh, to the organizers of the of these conferences and also to Angelina and, and all uh, the colleagues. Um, in my presentation, I will try first to address some questions about Marx's uh, theory of 
reproduction of capital and life. And then I will try to quickly go through the capitalist uh, history of family uh, and femininity. So as uh, you all know, one of the limitation of traditional Marxism in addressing patriarchy has been the reduction of capitalist domination to exploitation. This uh, led Marxist feminist theory to identify capitalist gender domination in the economic and political dependency that implied the non-wage domestic activities carried out by women in the family sphere. In the face of these uh, recent and new readings of Marx have pointed out that capital not only produces exploitation and class society, but also an abstract domination based on the extension and generalization of the ratio, uh, the tendency to the valorization of value, the accumulation of capital. So in capitalist society, the satisfactions, uh, satisfaction sorry, of needs and desires is subjected to the requirements of the expanding reproduction of capital. In addition to submitting the reproduction of life to the logic of capital, capitalism establishes a condition of generalized heteronomy. The individual for, its, uh, for his subsistence must participate in the market forms that fulfill functions in the valorization of capital, such as wage, uh, wage labor, capital, or rent. These social forms are not only economic functions of capital, but also the main modalities of social integration and subjectivation. This is what Marx called the mass character. Then uh, with this, in this way, Marx saw that the supposed neutral subject of market exchange formally and free, uh, sorry, formally free and equal, belongs structurally to a social class, but also his life his life is subjected to an heteronomous uh, social organization. However, the critique says nothing, nothing about gender relations, since it only contemplates the categories that are directly linked to the sphere of reproduction or the production and circulation of capitalist commodities. But the androcentrism of the of critique of this critique is, is evident in the fact that um, historically reproduction of capital has its condition of possibility in what lies outside of market relations and in also the concrete dimension of the commodity. Let me explain these two dimensions. Capital understood as an abstract logic of accumulation of value requires for, for its movement the material qualities of the means of production and consumer goods, but also it requires the uh, psychophysical bodies of the bearers of labor power. In addition, or on the other side, since the beginning of capitalism, there were activities not directly linked to the uh, sphere of the production and circulation of commodities, such as education, child rearing, care of the sick and disabled, of food preparation. Sometimes this activities were carried by state assistance through unproductive but wage services, and mainly they were carried out by women in the family sphere through unproductive and unpaid uh, work. Um, these concrete activities, uh, these concrete activities of life reproduction and care have historically entered and left the sphere of commodity circulation. So they were and directly related to the value sphere, but related to it in, uh, in a mediated way. So these categories are neither universal, not are they logical determination of capital, and they are also not uh, merely, uh, merely contingent. So I believe that here lies the great difficulty in understanding the relationship between patriarchy and capitalism. Mars approaches living subjects only as bearers of commodities whose reproduction has a market value, uh, except when he shows that labor power as a, as a logical presupposition of capital has its genesis on a historical event, the original accumulation. Labor power arises then at the beginning of capitalism from the violent disposition of autonomous means of production, and this includes uh, men and women, that forces the subject to sell the labor power for a wage in order to subsist. 
Labor power is not only then a logical determination of the movement of capital, which creates surplus value, but also a historical requirement. The particularity of labor power commodity relies on the fact that it's inseparable from its viewer. And also that is the only one which uh, can, uh, can create new value through uh, living labor objectified in the commodity. As the wage doesn't pay for the living labor, it only does for what the reproduction of labor power codes. Marx makes visible in this way the relation of exploitation, which is the basis of the capital profit. However, he does not remark that the value of labor, uh, labor power only contains the value of the commodities required for its reproduction. What does this mean? That the activities per more, uh, performed, sorry, historically by women in the domestic space, if they are no wage, do not increase the cost of labor power. Women's living labor is not contemplated in this framework of the critical political economy when it is no wage, because it does not influence directly the value relations, which uh, interested Marx. However, until this century, until uh, neoliberalism, the reproduction of living subjects occurred mainly outside the sphere of commodity production and circulation until, um, until 19th century, but also still occurs now, this made the cost of wages cheaper for the capital and continues to do so in a certain way. But it also left out of the rationality of productivity, some tax fundamental to the reproduction of life. This entails a historical tension in the processes of subordination and liberation of gender relations and those of capital. As you know, at the beginning of capitalism and until the 18th century, the family still constituted a basic economic unit. It produced for the market, but with the participation of all skilled members. There was no separation between the sphere of personal and private life, the family and the, sorry, between the personal life of the family no, and the sphere of wage labor of uh, market production. In this sense, until uh, the 19th century with the system or the pulling out system and the domestic workshop, the standard family was an economic and personal institution. Nevertheless, there was still a division of labor and hierarchical relation between genders, since the man was the legal guardian of the labor of women and children. So women were not the owners of their labor force. So she was under a double dependency, no? dispossessed of means of production and dispossessed of their own labor force. Until recent dec decades, this care activity of life sustaining um, and care took place mainly within, within two institutions, state and family. With, sorry, with the spread of the phenomena of uh, industrial revolution and proletarization in the 19th century and also in the early 20th century, the personal sphere of the family became now separated from the economic sphere of uh, wage labor. Women were then confined to the domestic sphere where they, where they perform tax of reproduction of life and uh, that were um, not directly paid for. Women continue to, go, uh, to be subordinated to men in this direct relationship of marriage, but now within the nuclear family. During Fordism, welfare state also provided uh, of conditions for the reproduction of capital, such as public infrastructure, but also uh, tax or reproduction of the labor force through public education and healthcare, uh, all these uh, uh, welfare guarantees or social guarantees. But access to this and uh, direct wage was possible through the figure of the way earner, the white male breadwinner. In this sense, and then for this, um, the nuclear and heterosexual family constituted not only the basic unit of access and redistribution of wealth, but also the place of women's confinement. As feminists um, pointed out, the sexual division of war was a source of feminine uh, suffering and a condition of uh, still the double dependency for women no? from 
disposes of the means of production and disposes of uh, her labor force. Nevertheless, family play an ambivalent role as a mediator between the sphere of commodity production and personal life. The same is true, this ambivalent role for, of women and femininity. On the, words, uh, on the one side, her activities uh, were not subordinated to the criteria of productivity and efficiency, but women were excluded for the sphere of mercantile, juridical, and political agency. Um, on the other hand, women uh, were the privileged targets of advertising of the uh, and cultural industry models, which generated codes of femininity through mass consumer products. And this uh, affected to the models of femininity, which were associated by the cultural industry and marketing with the attributes of the reproduction of life, empathy, care, affection, but also sacrifice and beauty. Finally, women also play, uh, play the role of watchdog over the moral conduct of husband and children so that they would comply with the discipline work ethic. Family, women, and femininity were thus associated not only with care and affection and solidarity, but also with vigilance and the standardization of behavior. In this way, female activities um, contributed or um, allowed lower wage costs for capital and contributed uh, to the formation of discipline, healthy skills, and willing workers. And at the present, the figure of the professional uh, woman has herself integrated the productivist work ethic. You know? This model of the employer of her labor force or the entrepreneur of her own labor force in neoliberalism is no longer gender. Moreover, the rationality of capital and productivity has expanded, uh, expanded to many spheres of life, personal and institutional. This has occurred through an ambivalent phenomena, phenomenon again for women. Women have entered the labor market. They are no longer materially dependent on men. And in addition, her political and civil rights have been recognized. But the withdrawal of social welfareism and the incorporation of women uh, into labor market has led to the privatization of the risk involved in the reproduction of life. This situation fall on, the, on families and especially on women who bear a double burden of work. The middle and upper classes have coped with this by outsourcing and commodifying till rearing and domestic work. But this work is large, largely performed by poor and migrant women in condition of semi-slavery in many cases. A structural unemployment and the withdrawal of welfareism have left many lives abandoned to the existential insecurity. Warranted work is no longer the basic modality of social integration and social mobility is tendentially downward. Wages don't pay anymore for the reproduction of life and market integration leaves short room for life and care. In this context, and maybe this is a bit provocative, but family functions as a center of economic security Family transfers uh, private inheritance, both wealth and debt, and also transfers the cultural, symbolic, and economic capital necessary to make the future labor power competitive. In this context, in this context uh, of neoliberal social Darwinism, the generalization of competition, family not only constitutes a possible nucleo, nucleus of solidarity to ensure subsistence, it also constitutes uh, a place for the formation of narcissistic and individualistic subjects, apt, apt, sorry, which must be apt for competition in the labor or business, uh, business market, either through wage or unwage or non-wage work. And I'm finishing now. Family then has also an ambivalent place uh, in our times, you know, as a place of care and as a place of preparation for competition. Today's capitalism demands from its subjects, from a no gender subject, a viril and productive behavior, no? masculine. This is to say a calculating competitive 
to seek, uh, succeed uh, seeking behavior that rejects empathy and solidarity as weak positions. This current condition for integration is really dangerous for the reproduction of life. And I believe uh, because of the historical position when women have played in the outside the, the sphere of uh, commodity production and reproduction, I believe that uh, we are more closer to experiences that can resist this subjective and social tendency uh, towards competition and productivity. So this doesn't mean to vindicate in, um, this doesn't mean vindicating femininity or, or the family institution, nor does it mean glorifying guaranteed uh, wage labor. I think it is about seeing what elements can be found in this dialectic of femininity and family and social welfareism uh, that allows us to resist the logic of capital through subjectivities and practices committed to solidarity, mutual support, community care, of life and the sustainability of nature. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you. Uh, now I am giving the floor to Maria Zagmeister and I am calling the audience to start thinking questions, remarks, comments they want to make and use the chat box. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Angelina, um, for putting up the panel. Thanks um, for everyone um, for listening. And thanks, Anthony, um, for handling the, the PowerPoint slides. Um, yeah, I will talk about um, the recentering class in intersectional legal gender studies. So I will uh, zoom into um, a lot of topics. Um, my the other um, speakers already mentioned uh, Christina now just in her um, talk mentioned the double burden and the problem of outsourcing um, labor. Um, I want to um, tackle um, some of those topics and um, do so especially for the um, area of law. So I won't talk about class and intersectionality on a very abstract level but um, zoom into the area of law, in particular labor law and um, ask what uh, legal gender studies analysis of law can gain from a stronger inclusion of class into the analysis and also what we might gain from um, integrating class and intersectional legal gender studies stronger in analyzing the law on a policy um, level. Um, next slide, please. Um, to give a short outline, as I think we're not all lawyers here, I thought I'll uh, begin by introducing um, the legal basis um, for the distribution of unpaid care work. Um, what I mean by the law's part in distributing unpaid care work, and then also introduce um, some of the feminist critique schemes of those legal frameworks, mainly working with the so-called dilemma of difference, which I will explain in a minute. And then in a second um, step, trying to dissect this dilemma, this uh, theoretical frame by stronger including class into the analysis, which is often left out of the picture in, in uh, traditional um, legal gender studies approaches. Um, I wanna do so on an individual and on a structural level, trying to use different um, theoretical class approaches and conclude with some thoughts on what this means for collectivity in labor law and therefore also for collectivity and social struggles relating to the labor law. And here I put up um, um, some pictures of um, um, a book where I wrote about those topics. Uh, it's in, in German, I realized, um, but perhaps some of you are able to understand or um, yeah, there are a lot of other um, interesting publications in English as well. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so what do I mean by the law? Uh, the last part in the distribution of unpaid care work. There is a whole body of equal treatment measures aiming to better distribute unpaid care work, meaning um, to stronger include men in um, taking the burden of unpaid care work oh, and generally just um, yeah, allowing for the what the law often calls the reconciliation of work and family or what we would call a dist distribution um, of unpaid labor. And in general, there are two different uh, big bodies of, um, 
of legal measures in the European labor law tradition, or um, speaking of. Um, we have birth-related leave policies, that is maternity protection, uh, especially, which um, is a mandatory measure in most um, European labor law um, systems that comes into place if an employee gives birth. You have a work ban for the last uh, weeks of pregnancy and for the first weeks following childbirth. Austria, we have a very strong um, uh, measure here. Um, women are not allowed to work for the last eight months of their pregnancy, uh, eight weeks of their pregnancy and the first eight weeks after childbirth. Um, fathers and co-parents, on the other hand, have a voluntary leave. Um, they need to invoke their right to leave. It's not a mandatory automatic scheme that comes into place. Then on the other hand, following those birth-related leaves, we have parental leave schemes um, in which all parents, um, never mind their gender, can invoke the right to childcare leave. So the main difference between those two bodies of measures is that uh, birth-related leaves treat employees and workers differently on grounds of sex. And um, we have mandatory measures in place for um, female employees for um, um, parental leave, we have formal treatment, uh, formally equal treatment of all parents and voluntary um, invokement measures for all. Um, important to also mention is um, that we not only have different treatment on grounds of sex, but very different treatment on grounds of employment status. I won't go into that now, but we maybe can talk about it in the discussion. Uh, next slide, please. Now for the feminist criticism of those measures, as I don't need to explain in the in our forum, I think is that they uh, don't work. Um, neither measure leads to a fair uh, distribution of unpaid care work. Still women uh, shoulder the burden of um, having to manage employment and unpaid work much more than men do. And why is that so? Um, a model of explanation we use in, in legal gender studies is the dilemma of difference, a term coined by Martha Minow, which goes that the law creates difference either by noticing difference or by ignoring it. And now what do I mean um, by that? Please next slide again. Next slide. Thank you. Yeah, what do I mean by uh, the law can create difference by ignoring difference? This is actually a very classical Marxist um, argument about legal criticism. It is that formal equal treatment freezes in place past consequences of difference by ignoring them. Even if men have the equal right to parental leave, they usually don't do their share. Because if lacking legal regulation, extra legal regulations or power relations come into play, such as gender norms or class related power structures, and those lead to women having to um, burden that work. Next slide, please. Um, that is what happens in the case of, of parental leave, equal treatment. Um, but now, um, why doesn't um, maternity protection, why don't special rights for women? Um, empower women more and lead to a more equal distribution of um, care work. This is um, because special rights sometimes backfire. Unequal treatment in the case of maternity protection is legally justified or even called for on grounds of um, pregnancy, maternity, health care um, needs, or also as affirmative action measures. But at the same time, they pre structure the distribution of unpaid care work as they limit available care arrangements. It's just a legal fact that surrounding child uh, birth, the mother will be home um, while the father or co-parent may or may not invoke his or her right. So mothers drop out of the labor market for a period of time. This strengthens stereotypical beliefs of motherhood and is very uh, related to the phenomenon of the glass ceiling, disadvantages in terms of promotion opportunity. And this is what uh, generally is, is referred to as the dilemma in um, legal gender studies, that we have a measure that wants to protect or promote um, women's um, participation in the labor market, but at the same time, it limits their opportunities um, regarding promotion, et cetera. And this is now where I think um, this frame is somewhat limited when it fails to include um, an analysis of um, class on different levels. Um, next slide, please. Um, 
First, um, I think an intersectional class analysis um, approach on an individual level can already help us to better understand um, is, if this is a dilemma or maybe not. And here I can uh, build on much that um, Christina already mentioned. If we understand class as a signifier of social economic inequality, as it is widely understood in, in intersectionality studies, I'd say, um, then we must notice that different equal treatment measures affect different groups of women differently within the group of working women. And there is a correlation between maternity leave and perceptions of women's suitability for leadership, that, but it mostly affects highly qualified women. And lacking maternity protection or other measures, they are more likely to find individual reconciliation solutions. And this again connects to global care chains. They might be in this uh, um, position to find a private reconciliation solution. But um, next slide, please. Um, this is not true for all working women and not for all working men. Most uh, working women and men do not have the option to outsource um, their work. And they depend on mandatory uh, measures. They depend on mandatory maternity protection. So if you say um, you have to see um, that different measures affect different groups of women, you also have to see which measures benefit um, women with low, particularly low individual bargaining power in low wage sectors. And those are mandatory protective measures. Here you must also see the disadvantage of the need to invoke voluntary leave because of course you might have the right to invoke a right to leave, but still you are, you find yourself within very unequal negotiation situations. Um, yeah, and I, I borrowed the term um, class the ceiling from Nomi Khan and uh, Michael Selmy, which I find uh, quite a good um, point about the class ceiling. Yeah, um, next slide, please. So if we now uh, take the analysis of um, labor law protection for working parents to a more structural level, um, I think that the class analysis approach from a more Marxist um, perspective proves very beneficial, seeing that labor law has a very specific um, purpose within unequal class relations to counteract the inequality of bargaining power in the employment relationship, which just is inherent to the employment relationship because you have employees on the one and employers on the other. And uh, labor law tries to counteract um, the unequal bargaining power. For one, of course, by installing rights to collective bargaining and collective um, organizing, um, unions, etc. Um, but also on the individual law level. Um, individual labor law meaning protective frameworks such as maternity protection or a right, um, a protection against dismissal. And here mandatory protective frameworks um, are the most important measures because they protect collective working class interests even though they protect the individual worker because um, being able to um, take parental leave is of course an individual interest of the working uh, parent in question, but it represents a collective interest of all people depending on work. And um, therefore mandatory provisions can counteract unequal power relations. And this is what um, this drawing by David Trigley um, also kind of um, tries to, to show us that, um, yeah, in a, in a world where compulsions, extra legal compulsions rule, then sometimes you need a, um, a legal compulsion to counteract those extra legal compulsions. But here I want to call upon the dilemma again, because this is only true in a limited um, way as long as mandatory provisions target only specific groups, because this is now the fact that um, if only um, women are subject to mandatory um, leave periods, only they drop out of the labor market and they um, face the disadvantages that come with that. Um, next slide, please. And here I think that um, intersectionality must inform the, um, the notion of labor law and the idea of protecting collective workers' interests because we need to define collective workers' interest, not in the sense of a male breadwinner worker, but in the sense of um, people who might need protection on, on different levels. 
So I, I took a scope, uh, um, um, this line from Kimberly Cranshaw, who says, when we must, um, at the law must address the needs and problems of those who are most disadvantaged, then others who are singular, singularly disadvantaged would also benefit. So I think for the scope of um, parental protection rights, this would mean to make working mothers the norm, to take their needs. And this is also most disadvantaged can be a very moral um, term, but um, in, in terms of um, protective needs, it, it shouldn't be so much. Um, I, what I'm thinking about is that um, here are health uh, measures needed and um, social protective needs um, also, but we have a, a healthcare issue that cannot be um, denied pregnant workers. So I'd say their need is kind of the starting point here. So if we make working mothers the norm instead of the exception, not addressing them by special rights such as uh, maternity protection, but install mandatory um, parental leaves for all, which um, protect the needs of working mothers, but extend the rights um, to all groups of um, parents depending on labor. This I think is called for from a class perspective as, as I explained, mandatory provision substitute individual bargaining power, um, relieving people of the need to invoke their right. And from a gender perspective, it is called for because um, equally mandatory provisions do not allow men to opt out. Um, it forces men to take a share of their leave and protects them as workers. So this is where I think um, it is not only beneficial on an analytic, but also on a policy level um, to include class from an intersectional perspective when thinking about what kinds of um, laws would serve a more um, equal distribution of unpaid care work. So um, next slide, please. This is also where I, um, where I end um, when where I see the potential of um, this idea for struggle also. Making working mothers the benchmark for parental protective rights might lead to a redefinition of collectivity in labor law as general, when we not only think about parental protection, but for example, working time norms, that we just install working time norms, which allow um, for workers with care responsibilities to still have time to do their care work, um, this should inform the collective interest of labor law. We, we now do call for a reduction of um, working time for all and not just for working women. Um, this also has the potential, of course, to reimagine workers' issues to include issues beyond the workplace. And um, therefore also reimagine sites and forms of organization of uh, working struggles beyond the traditional workplace, because if a worker's issue is not only in the workplace, but also in the home, then this also becomes a potential site for their workshop, uh, for, their, for their struggle. As I think um, we can already witness um, feminist strikes um, doing around the world. Um, yeah, thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you very much. Thank you all, actually. Um, now we have plenty of time for questions and remarks, observations on what you heard, but also if you want to, you know, deepen the arguments of uh, the speakers. Um, so far, I have one question in the chat box. I encourage you to put more, but also I have some uh, by myself, of myself. Uh, it is not the question that addresses a particular speaker, so you can all take the floor and reflect. Um, so, um, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, Silvia Federici yesterday mentioned that she is critical towards Marx theory. For example, when it comes to the preconditions for change, especially when we discuss about the destruction of the environment uh, by the capitalism or the climate catastrophe. In how far do you see the ground for overcoming the separation of production and reproduction on the grounds of contemporary capitalism? Okay, I, I'm giving the floor to Ankit and you can think. 
Um, thank you so much for the excellent question. I'm I'm really sad that I wasn't um, uh, able yesterday to to attend uh, Federici's presentation. That's why it's uh, I think very important for you to record uh, all those important talks so we can learn peacefully later on. Um, I will just reflect on several thoughts since, since uh, uh, Federici is I think really uh, important uh, for my research. So maybe just uh, I will try to give some. Uh, pieces of of the of answer to the, to really important question. Like uh, first of all, um, um, I have to agree uh, both with uh, Federici, uh, but also with with uh, uh, Barbara's question. Um, but let me start with the beginning. I think then in an effort uh, to propose a theoretical, methodological, historical model that uh, would uh, enable us uh, uh, to have some kind of valid analysis of the relationship of oppression, primarily understood through the categories of gender, race or sexuality and exploitation, primarily understood through the category of class, I think that one indeed needs to use Marx as a point of departure, the same as Federici does. Um, so in a way, I think that what we need to do uh, in our uh, insisting on harnessing a living Marxist thought is to uh, offer a more precise responses to the explanations of the growing economic crisis and newly appearing forces of economic life, since Marx lived in uh, one kind of structured capitalism and we live today in others. Uh, so I think that we need somehow to use Marx as a starting point, but as Marxist feminists, we need to develop his theory in a more clear manner. That's why I think that social reproduction uh, theory really works for us here. And since Marx has dedicated really little attention to questions of gender, family, and social reproduction in the feminist sense, I think that is why and believe that we have to insist on Marxist feminists. But just, just to try to introduce a little bit of Rosa Luxemburg here, I think that when she criticized Marx for neglecting the spatial uh, analytical element in her analysis of capitalism, I think she was on a good way. Um, uh, Luxembourg held that Marx has completely neglected capitalist spatial determination, uh, while he was mainly uh, focusing his, uh, himself on time, exclusively on time. That's why I think that, that Luxembourg's theory of accumulation and her critique not only on the level of, of the category of time, but introducing the space as something that we, uh, in terms of today, really use, and um, uh, not just uh, in, in a good way, but uh, catastrophically in terms of ecology. So I think that uh, somehow we need to introduce also uh, works of, I don't know, John Bellamy Foster's and other eco-Marxists that also start with Marx, but then again, uh, trying, trying to, they're, they're trying to somehow use him in terms of the more recent and contemporary social formation and the crisis we are facing today. Thank you so much, Ankitsa. Okay, I will move forward with other questions. Um, I think it was mentioned by two of the speakers, uh, the whole outsourcing the social reproduction thing, right? And um, I am always concerned regarding this. This social reproduction that is carried by poor, uh, most of the times migrant, often of color women. Uh, how can we connect our struggles with the struggles of these women. I mean, I, I have constantly the concern which link brings together uh, the woman who cleans the house with the woman who actually hires her to clean her house. Because I, I know that this kind of social reproduction work is something that can be paid even by women, not of um, you know high classes or, or, or middle classes, even if women of the working class can afford to hire another woman and clean her house like once per two weeks or once per month. I mean, at least in Greece, this is feasible. We don't have women who clean our houses only if we are very rich, wealthy, you know. So how, what is the link that can bring these women together? Um, this is one question. Who would like to reflect first on that? 
Montserrat, Maria, Cristina. Okay, Cristina and then Maria. Also something uh, related to the other question. So if it's okay, I will mix both. But I believe uh, that maybe um, in Mars uh, theory, there was something that he, this, uh, he didn't uh, consider it politically, which is that the, one of the main contradictions of uh, the reproduction of capital um, in, capitalism, in capitalist societies is between life and, and capital. So that everything is subjected to the needs of capital means that the, the system cannot satisfy needs and, and desires. Uh, so I think this is something that um, implies that in order to subsist, in order to be integrated, you know, in order to, to, to make a living uh, in the sense that Capitalism departs from the dispossession of the means of production of a mass uh, of uh, of the majority of the part of the population. This uh, leaves us in a dependency um, condition. So we need to get a monetary income through the the selling of our labor power, or to become or act in our days becoming. Uh, empreneurs, no? uh, empreneurs. Yeah, yes. So, uh, in this sense, in in the developing uh, in the historical developing of capitalism in in the post for this period, uh, in the sense that now the life uh, the life uh, so the, the activities that sustain life, the reproduction activities, are also contained and included now in the sphere of the reproduction of capital. So in this sense, uh, there is no an autonomous sphere of reproduction of life, even though it was uh, useful for the sustainability of capital reproduction, but at least it has some kind of autonomy in the sense that care activities were not always uh, subsumed uh, to the criteria of productivity or efficiency. But nowadays, I wanted to say nowadays, everything, you know, even life reproduction is, sub is subjected to the criteria of productivity. And also everyone uh, depends on, a, on a, uh, for, for the sustainability, uh, for the subsystem, we all depend on a in monetary income. So, this is also that I think, uh, sir, the person who cleans the house and the, uh, the, uh, the middle class wo uh, woman that pays for this um, work. In this sense, there is a, a dependency for the sustainability of life and, and the sustainability of affection and care. Uh, there is a dependency on the market for everyone. And the condition of reproduction of a good life, of a life um, is, uh, is for everyone, of, except for an elite um, link to the necessity of becoming competitive in the marketplace, in the labor market. In this way, there is a tension here because even if we want to, no, as middle class B, um, uh, to, if we want to, uh, in the feminist movement, uh, have some kind of solidarity between uh, women in different social classes, on the, uh, on the same time, at the same time, sorry, the imperative to compete for integrating in the labor market no, makes us uh, to behave in a competitive, structurally way, no. So uh, it's a for me. It's a very it's very difficult because the only way of of finding something that can um, that can uh, that we can all share, women uh, who clean the houses and women who pay for this, is that. Uh, in order to be integrated, in order to subsist, we all have to uh, accomplish 
the behavior of a competitive subject. So we can only serve uh, uh, the utopian or the practical uh, desire of putting the reproduction of life in the center. So putting like solidarity uh, relations in the center. But this, and I am finishing now, is, is a, it's very problematic then in the, in the practice, if we don't find institutions or like communitary ways of reproduc uh, reproduction of life without market relations, because the market the labor market integration demands that we are competitive and competent. And we prepare our um, descendants also for that. Well, I didn't explain it very well, but uh, sorry. No, you did explain it perfectly. Uh, now I have to give the floor to Maria and Montserrat. Would you like to have the floor after Maria? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that very important question. Um, I think how to integrate those struggles um, is it's it's very necessary, and I think it is because the the struggles of domestic workers at the moment are actually at the heart of the feminist struggle and um, the workers movement or they should be because um, they um, struggle with um, both the extreme devaluation of their work because it is gendered work in the private household and they suffer from an erosion of the labor market as um, employers employees that are not recognized legally as employees who are often migrants who do not have access to unionized um, organizing, um, at least that's the case in, in Austria, because the law um, treats them as self-employed um, people, which leaves them outside the scope of, um, of workers. And then we have um, the very difficult uh, situation that the employers are often in a contradictory class position because they are workers um, themselves, but um, also employers of of workers and at least, um, yeah. But I think this is something um, where that shouldn't divide um, the feminist movement. I think we shouldn't, um, um, yeah, let us de be divided because of this contradictory position, but focus on the source um, of that problem, which is the sexual division of labor and the need to, um, to be, that women are, are responsible for that kind of work and there is no um, social network, um, neither in the family because women cannot depend on their partners um, equally to um, shoulder that burden or the society at, in larger because um, it is left on the private family households to manage that kind of work. And I think we should criticize these structures and um, not concentrate too much on the individual um, being the employer. Also because um, for the larger organization of this kind of work, it is not such an individual relationship, but it is mainly agencies and um, platforms um, that organize work. And um, at least in, in Austria, the struggle is not so much to um, fight single employers um, but the big agencies and to um, have them legally recognized as employers and as responsible for the workers. Thank you, Maria. Montserrat? Yes, yes, thank you. I think it's not an individual problem, not a, a private problem, but uh, we can work together with collectives like the Kellys in Spain. It's uh, women who clean and hotels. Or Territorio Domestico, it's, it's a, a collective of women who, who clean uh, family houses. And uh, we can work together uh, against capitalism because it's the main antagonist. Uh, we are all dependent of the work of others. And uh, that is the, the problem is the evaluation of this work, not the work 
in itself. An autonomous movement of women who are working at the domestic sphere is, the, for me, is the, a big part of the feminist movement. Uh, and uh, we can, are together, we find these persons in the, at the, uh, in the neighborhoods as uh, a, a, a normal people. And we have to put the reproduction on the social and, com and common level and not see uh, only as a commodity, uh, but uh, a, a common work to, uh, to make possible to live. I think it's another perspective and that is very important for the feminists that uh, this distinction between classes, it's inside the feminist, but we can uh, together make a, a, a better life. Yes. Thank you, Montserrat. Thank you. Uh, another question is, um, yeah, it applies to all of you. And it is quite a big question, I think. How does social reproduction theories uh, can be a tool for political change. What political demands can we make out of um, lightening the field of uh, reproduction and the unpaid labor connected to it? How can the feminist movement use all this work that you just presented, for example? I, I can try ah. maybe j just to offer a, a simple and, and, and modest answer. Uh, well, uh, first of all, and I think it, it's uh, kind of related to the other question that um, was proposed here in the chat room uh, by Maria Gartenskoskaskosea, sorry for mispronouncing uh, the surname. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, that social reproduction theory is definitely not just a theory. I think it's really as proposed a, a strong analytical, but also um, a tool in terms of policies, as Maria uh, really clearly pointed out. What might be the concrete, um, um, what is to be done answers uh, uh, in those terms? First of all, um, I think that we need to constantly, um, in the terms of the um, uh, uh, the sphere of production and the sphere of exploitation and sphere of class struggle ask the feminist questions. That means to constantly integrate simultaneously the questions of production and reproduction. But that also goes the other way around in feminist terms. When we speak about gender, we need to speak about class struggles. We need to speak about some kind of processes that relates to sexism, discrimination, not just at work, but also at home. I think in the times of the pandemic, um, especially when really social reproduction theory is all around us, there is some kind of already given answer. So what is essential? for the production, what is essential for reproducing the society. It definitely is the reproductive work, but we also have to understand that reproduction is not just uh, something, uh, some kind of activity that we do just in our homes. Social reproduction is also connected to migrant work, especially female migrant work, it somehow reflects on the stability of families. You can imagine what happens when women go outside at families and leave guys at home just to tackle the, the, the childcare. It's, it's really a hard question. Not to mention in that terms also um, uh, the question of a public sphere. Uh, what is reproduction in terms of healthcare and education, the producing of life? and things like that. So I think that the question is really complex um, and we do, we do not need to answer them like simply because they're not simple. But what we no, need to do is uh, I think going in short terms, but also on long ones. The short term is definitely to fight for reproductive work, to try to somehow make it visible and to give it like a political um, strength 
not just in terms of, I don't know, a conference where we speak about the problems, but try to involve it in the political uh, or even political economical uh, uh, sphere of uh, trying to, to somehow um, uh, deal with the question. And on the other hand, again, and, and there I'm finished, we also to need to think about it in long terms, how to fight it anti-capitalistically, not just in terms of reforms and policies, but also to do it more, I, I know it's, it's, it's not um, a modern way to say um, uh, in revolutionary terms, but we need to think, I think, in longer terms, not just for the sake of feminism, but also for this planet, I think. We cannot think it without uh, unsustainable and sense sustainability uh, questions in that terms. So I think that politics, political economy, uh, economy, feminism had to be in the center of the questions of sustainability, not just uh, some kind of um, add-on question, but integral part of short-term and long-term politics. Thanks, Akita. Who else would like to take the floor? We have also some other questions. The first one is, um, how should we direct our advocacy in terms of social policy to recognize, reduce, and redistribute the unpaid reproductive labor? Is there any other idea other than what Lombardozzi proposed, for example, the universal basic uh, income, etc.? Another. A very interesting question is about sex work. How do you see sex work in the productive reproductive framework, since there are so many similarities in demands between collectives of care workers and collectives of sex workers? I would like to take the floor. Well, I can do it. Christina, yes. Um, well, it's a very simple and basic idea about the how to politic uh, politically address the problem of reproduction of life. You have already say the basic income, universal basic income, but also I think there are also some kind of um, policies that can be demanded without thinking of them uh, as mere final goals, just a means to court circuitate, like to break this vicious circle of uh, pro, uh, of uh, generating competitive individuals, so that we can, in in certain sense, um, uh, act individually, but for a common case. Do you know uh, what I mean? Is that in order to um, take action, like a more general action, the individual has I believe in this uh, contemporary social Darwinism has had to have uh, some kind of time apart from the time of formation and work uh, and working time. So maybe also again asking for the regulation of the labor market um, the, for some conditions of, uh, for example, like again a decrease of working hours. Also, I think it's very important not only for uh, wage um, workers, but also to address the problem of um, autonomous workers, workers uh, that are no wage, but are very precarious in a very precarious situation. So the regulation of, of the amount of hours that, that a person can work during a week, and also, um, uh, again, uh, was conciliatory policies, and um, again, uh, to, to do something against uh, human resources criteria of, um, of, uh, that are extending now to elect candidates for wages and uh, employment. And I was thinking also that, but this is very idealistic, but that the, uh, that, we could also think about institutions like they were the trade unions, but more plur more plural and more uh, and smaller, which are based on um, solidarity links. But the problem that I see in contemporary world with this is that 
mm, if they are plural and not big institutions and they are uh, and they are centered in the specific uh, situation for example of domestic work sex work etc that is happening now the only problem that i see here uh, what i think is a very good uh, the, the new trade unions for example also for um, housing and um, mortgages, uh, care work, etc. I think the, the only that this is a good phenomenon, these institutions or, or movements uh, of mutual support. But um, the only thing that we can uh, we, we should be um, or we, sh we could be fear uh, about this is that they can um, well, that they can be, um, they can find corporativist um, demands. So, okay, we need to avoid that the small uh, institutions and movements based on solidarity, they uh, end up uh, demanding only corporate, corporativist uh, demands, corporativist policies. Thank you, Christina. Uh, Montserrat? Well, uh, yes, I think that feminist is not more a middle class movement. It's a movement, uh, a, a very inclusive movement for all women and uh, for, for men, because it's a movement for all persons, not only women. And there are a lot of new problems like sex work. We have to recognize there are feminist women in the sex work. And that is a reality. Like there are feminists in the uh, domestic work, in the clean work, in the always by the police. <laughs> also, then, of course, it's a big problem, but I think feminism. So far, it's an inclusive movement has to recognize this reality and include this problem on the, uh, on the discussion about feminism, about feminist strategies, and so on. We can, uh, we can uh, think that uh, feminism is a movement of middle class women with uh, family, hetero uh, normative family, with uh, good works, uh, good paid, and so on. And uh, only the problem uh, is the equality uh, of, uh, with, the, with the men. That was the past of feminism, but, but that is not the present of our movement, I think. And these other feminist voices uh, have uh, to must to be recognized in the movement with the conflict. Obviously, there are new problems and new conflicts, but I think we fight together for the new world, for the new world. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Montserrat. Who else? Maria, would you like to take the floor? We we have all the questions as well, if you have seen already the chat box. A question regarding the relation between social reproduction and the question of environment. And um, yeah, the key uh, word of care in the sense of the environmental crisis. Mm. Yeah, um, thank you, but and, and Kika had uh, raised her hand. Ah, uh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I haven't seen. Okay, oh, sorry, if you, Kita. If you want to 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 give an answer or something, uh, Maria, just just take take the microphone. No problem. Um, yeah, I I thought the comparison of care work and sex work um, also very important. I think uh, what we have in both cases is um, uh, the missing recognition of an activity as work, um, because you know. I guess you know the, the text, the labor of love, that care, but also sex work are uh, seen not as, as actual work, but as something that women freely give. And why uh, should they be um, paid 
for it in a, in a um, correct way. And also from a legal point of view, it is that um, both areas are, are not well um, regulated. So I think there are similar struggles um, there too. And again, we have uh, often, it's a, um, a, like a triangle of how work relations go that you have a, a service provider and a client, um, but in the background, you also have an agency um, that is managing the work and who is actually also a kind of employer, although the, the service client relationship, the most obvious one is a different one. And um, just one note on, 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 on environment and care, I think in both cases is, is key to um, largely reduce work, um, just produce less, have more time um, to care and um, in the same, uh, moment stop um, producing so much uh, waste. And Keita? Yes, ju just a, a short reflection on sex work, but I think I will just repeat what the previous speakers brilliantly pointed pointed out. Um, so I think that already in domestic labor debate, that was quite clear quite clear that, that that social reproduction is always going through three different levels. One is taking care of a worker, the second is to care of non-worker, meaning children and, and elderly and sick, and the third is child, uh, giving the child birth. So in terms of giving some kind of um, the care work uh, in terms of workers, always sex was included. Not just in terms of sex work, which is paid, but also in our homes. So we are, I hope we are having sex sometimes. So the questions for Silvia Federici, for instance, was, is this also social reproduction uh, work? And what kind of processes are enabling all of us to like um, uh, go uh, in a world in a peaceful manner and, and, and somehow therapeutically, whatever uh, uh, the sex implies for everyone uh, 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 here. So I think that uh, a very important thing is not to speak of sex in terms of moralization. I have mm -hmm. to point out that radical feminism is complicating things a bit, I think. And then again, we have to speak, I think, again, in terms of social reproduction, since um, uh, sex really in terms of um, um, a paid unpaid relation has to deal uh, 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 in terms uh, of, of sex work. Not to mention that uh, the third thing, the Nordic model, which is, um, often uh, proposed as a progressive one. But if you want to take women from the sex work and giving them low paid jobs, that's I think, again, really serious question in terms of sex work. Thank you so much, Sankitsa. It actually, you, you totally paved the way to say that tomorrow at 12, uh, there is a panel under the title The State, the Law, Institutionalizations and Reproduction, where we are going to have also a presentation about sex work as work. And it is a, precisely about what you described and I think all of your perceptions. Um, well, and now we really need to close. I think that the countdown will start um, appearing in our screen. Thank you so much all for participating in this panel. Thank, I, a big thanks to our speakers. They, they had wonderful presentations and thank you all for participating actively with your questions, etc. Please do stay in the conference in half an hour from now. There is a big plenary uh, about the 13 thesis of Marxist feminism. It would be a presentation of this thesis and a debate upon that. It says at yes, uh, 12 Central European time. And of course, there are plenaries also at 4 and then at 6.30. Uh, the conference um, will be until tomorrow uh, evening. Uh, thank you all. I want to thank also the technical team that was assisting us with the chat and the presentations and the microphones, etc. They always do also an invisible work. <laughs> thank you so much and uh, please enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Angelina, for moderating. Bye bye. Bye bye to all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.